So you better get it right. So for example, biodiversity informatics, a critical to understand and conserve bio biodiversity. Oops. 1993, I published a paper, Conservation Priorities on Altitudinal Gradients, something like that. I read the proof, corrected a few errors, packaged it up, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, remember that? Took it to the mail room, went back to my office. But I'd made a copy, and I'm looking at the copy as I'm on, as I'm on the phone. The title was not Conservation Priorities, but Conversation Priorities. Okay? So, here, notice that I'm annotating something and then I'm putting out in the margin italics. Okay, change a total was, not a total were. Um, the usual problems with diacritical marks in, in uh, Spanish language surnames. Uh, you know, here was one that was a little complicated. I wanted it to be split endoparasite, not endoparasite. Okay? Endoparasite just sounded ugly to me. Um, and then more recently, what we're doing is we're editing PDFs. And you have to see how the journal wants you to edit. Sometimes it's with the editing features, and sometimes it's with these sticky notes but you have to give the editor or the journal what they want, okay? You know, one end, two ends, things like that. So, we're there. You correct it. This is just a little last detail. I'm not gonna do open access, okay? Everybody, or almost everybody, had published a paper. How many of you have read the copyright transfer agreement carefully? The contract is so answer your, your soul. <laughs> exactly, sell your soul. Have you read one? Okay, yes. good. But I don't like that sometimes I cross the bubber to, to go away. For the book that I just had published last year, the contract had me promising my next book to the same publisher. Yeah, Johns Hopkins had that. Um, so what is a copyright transfer agreement? When you are working on a paper, you had an idea, you worked on it, you went out into the field and, you know, suffered and broke leg or whatever. You secured funding or you used your own funding. But you also used your own brain power. And this is a little bit different from country to country and situation to situation. But most legal systems recognize a person's right to his or her intellectual property. And particularly when we're going to make that public. Like if we have a conversation and I say something or you say something that's very interesting and the other person develops it and publishes it, that's ugly. But it was also informal. But if I publish a paper and you just decide that you know, the first four paragraphs of that paper are very well written, and so you copy them and paste them as the introduction to your paper. One, it's easier to detect and dom document, but two, it's quite a bit less appropriate. And I guess the first example is not appropriate either. Um, but what I'm after is that manuscript up to right here is yours. It's your intellectual property. 
So I'm going to put on my Elsevier hat. Okay? Not my anti-Elsevier hat. Elsevier would say, we're going to put a lot of time and money into uh, typesetting your paper, making it look really attractive, really professionally done. They would say, we're going to host your paper on our you know, electronic website servers and all that. And they would say that, um, that their marketing, you know, all the things that they do to increase the impact factor of their journals, all of that is to your benefit. And even now they'd say, and we give these research tools. So maybe, you know, as you're reading my paper, you're seeing all of the related papers. And maybe there's a link, you know, other papers by this author, papers citing this paper. And so all of that is getting more people to look at you and your work. And so Elsevier is going to say, we're doing a lot and we really shouldn't do it for free. And that's a valid argument. Now on your side, you should be saying, those are my ideas. And I'm willing to give you something to get my paper published, but I really want those ideas to be mine. Your institution might say, well, we were paying you so those ideas, in some sense, are ours. And your funding body might say, well, we provided you with a grant for that research, so that research is ours. So who owns the paper? <laughs> well, in some situations, like if you work for the US government, the US government does not recognize copyright. And so a US government employee, if you look the next time you publish something in the copyright transfer agreement, it says, are you a US government employee? And if you say yes, then the journal can't own the copyright and you can't either. Okay? But most of us, I'm not a US government employee, most of us are not subject to that. Um, some funding bodies, like the Wellcome Trust or uh, the National Institutes of Health at the US, have a policy that any research funded by us is to be open access. So whatever your desire for copyright transfer is, regardless, the paper is going to be open access within six months or within 12 months. Um, my university has a policy that says that by virtue of my being a faculty member, I have already given the University of Kansas permission to serve a copy of my paper. With delay or provided? That's subject to negotiation. Um, but in effect, Strictly speaking, I've given them permission to circulate a copy immediately. Um, now, all of those latter things, the university level is debatable, and journals frequently debate us about that. But you have to sign this copyright transfer agreement. So there are a couple of things you should know. One is that copyright is a bundle of rights. It is the opportunity to perform or to display the work. It is the opportunity to repackage and republish the work. It's all sorts of things that you might want to do with your work in the future. And so when you see full copyright transfer, which you will see, what that means is you have given up all intellectual rights to your work. Technically speaking, I'll say, let, let's say under US law, technically speaking, you're not even allowed to give a seminar on your own work without the journal's 
permission. Technically speaking. I don't know of anybody who has been taken to court on that point. Huh? <laughs> Well, nonetheless, that is the legal situation. Now, sometimes you will see full copyright transfer, but the publisher cedes the rights, gives up the rights to, for future presentation or for presentations for educational materials. So generous of you, okay? Anyhow, you should read that agreement. And at the very least, I'm not going to give you the full uh, sign on the dotted line open access uh, sermon, um, but you should at least be aware of what you are signing before you sign it. If you were buying a house, I'm guessing that you will read the contract before you sign on the dotted line. Why don't you do that with your work? And the other thing to remember is that that is a contract. And being a contract, it can be edited. And so at least in theory, if there is something that is enormously offensive or completely unacceptable to you, you can draw a line through it, put your initials, and sign the edited copy. Now, the journal can come back to you and say, we do not accept the edited copy but you have the right to negotiate the terms of the contract. In fact, with my open access friends a couple years ago, we were invited to publish a paper in a Taylor and Francis journal. And Taylor and Francis, it's not as bad as Elsevier, but it's almost as bad. Um, Taylor and Francis had indicated us to, to us that they would open access to that special issue, which was about open access. And then after our paper was accepted for publication, they told us that that wasn't quite true and they weren't going to open, ac open the access. And so we, we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on the copyright agreement and we edited it and they edited our edits and it was back and forth and back and forth. And this is what you do late in your career when you don't care about a publication. But at the end, we said to Taylor and Francis, okay, we'll retract the paper. Don't publish it, it's fine. And at that, they said, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's that bad. So, you sign that agreement, for better or for worse, you sell your soul to the devil, as Arturo put it, and there we are. You're published. How are we doing on time? One twenty. Okay, we should we should move fairly soon to lunch. How long does it take? It can be as few as let's say three or four weeks. And it can be as much as more than a year. Um, Kate, how long has your Crotalus paper been in process? I originally submitted it October of 2013. <coughs> so there's. Just the week before we got here, well, two days before we left, finally got accepted with minor revisions. It's the second round of editing. So it's still not published. It's like two comments that I have to change. So Kate is here after a year and a half. Yeah. Now that's a kind of a local or regional journal. It's not a particularly high budget thing. Yeah. You know, I don't think we expected them to be, you know, really fast. But it can take months to years. One thing you can look at in terms of deciding which journal to send it to is if in many or most journals if you look up near the top of the paper, like around the title and abstract, m many times it'll say, submitted date this, accepted date this, published date this. And if you see you know, 10 papers that are a year and a half, then your paper is not coming out soon. 
okay? So certainly also it makes a difference if the journal is fully electronic. So for example, with the PLOS journals, there really is no detailed copy editing, you know? You prepared the electronic version of the paper, so it better be right. You prepared the figures, so they better be right. And essentially all they do is pour the text into a template, pick out where each figure and table goes, and it kind of formats itself, okay? Um, and so that can be, you know, from this stage to this stage, that can be extremely fast. I'd like to know if after six months of no answer from the editor-in-chief, we could write to him to, to know the status of our manuscript. As most of the time, you have just three years of funding for mm -hmm. the research. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. Um, in a way, what it comes down to is in this post-submission procedures, what you want to do is maintain the very best relationship with the editor possible. Because remember, what you really want is that you send in your revision and the ex editor accepts. Yes. So if you are, if the editor perceives you as harassing mm -hmm. or being impatient or being pushy, mm -hmm. it's a bad idea. But there are times when, you know, a paper gets lost. Yeah. Um, many times nowadays you can track the progress of your paper online. And so, you know, you go back to the submission portal and you sign in and you can see your submitted manuscripts and you look at it and it'll say, you know, out for review, you know, and then it'll say two reviews returned, awaiting decision of editor. And if it stays there for three months, that's usually a point where you can say, um, you know, I noticed this has been this way for quite a while. Um, you know, I actually consider it to be kind of bad luck to be checking on my papers, so I just try to forget, up, forget about them, but that's me. Okay? Yeah.